Welcome to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is David Hassel. David is the founder and CEO of 15.5, the leading web-based employee feedback and alignment solution that is transforming the way employees and managers communicate. Named the most connected man you don't know in Silicon Valley by Forbes magazine, David has also been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Inc., Entrepreneur, Wired, Fast Company, and the Financial Post. Today we're going to be discussing his book, The Great Ebook of Employee Questions. David is one of the most thoughtful entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Let's ask him five good questions. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is David Hassel, author of The Great Ebook of Employee Questions. Uh, David, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Yeah, great. It's great to be here. Thanks. So <clears throat> let's jump right in. Uh, question number one. Children ask upwards of 300 questions per day. Uh, right. And as adults now, you know, we're maybe only in the, a handful of questions that actually, you know, important questions other than like what's for dinner. Uh, right. So are we missing something by asking fewer and probably smaller questions than children? Uh, absolutely. It's, 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 it's an interesting phenomenon. I know there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of research and study done around this, this very topic. And for, for whatever reason, you know, just as human beings, I think that we, um, when we become familiar with something and it becomes known, it's, it somewhat fades into the background of our experience that the things that we tend to put our attention on are the new and the different. And it's really a survival mechanism, right? It's like we're, we're scanning our environment for, for threats. You know, that's what our, what our biology is doing. And it, you've probably had the experience where you've gone on vacation and, you know, the first few days seem like it's lasting forever. And all of a sudden you get to the middle of the week and the second week goes by in a flash, right? It's because you, you're not, uh, experiencing these new experiences anymore, right? And so you're you're just you're just scanning now the surface for what's different. And so the same thing happens around curiosity and questions. And so really cultivating a, a practice of curiosity is the antidote to that, right? Um, of, of, of not taking for granted that everything actually is the way that you think it is. Because we get in we get into uh, almost assuming that we know, right, we, when we don't know about a lot of things, and we miss out on, on inquiry, uh, because we, you know, it, as a safety mechanism, if something's not changing or dangerous, we, we assume we know it's, it's, it is the way it is, and we don't ask. Right, yeah, and I think um, one of the things I've always found fascinating is there's a book by um, Samuel Arbusman called The Half-Life of Facts, and... Uh -huh. This idea that the facts that are in our head are actually decaying at some kind of known rate as a as a population. Wow. Um, the idea that okay, well maybe I need to not just assume that what I know is actually true, and I need to at least refresh once in a while. You know what? Right. What, uh, what's in my head? Exactly. Yep. <clears throat> so question number two: You have two must-ask questions that that every boss should be asking their employee. What yeah. are those two questions and, and why are they so effective? Why are those your two kind of go to questions? So there's two there's there's two static questions. You know, we, we, we have a product where we ask questions of between managers and employees and the two that we recommend always, every week, all the time are what are your successes? Right. So first, putting attention on the positive. Most most people go straight to what's wrong. Right. Our, our natural inclination, just like we talked about in, in the curiosity piece, is scanning for threats. So it's so easy to be focused on the negative of where I'm stuck that you're not actually focused on what progress am I making and where am I succeeding and what ha the, the impact to your mood on that is can be really significant. So the first thing is actually looking for what's right. Right. So having that orientation, so where are you succeeding? So because we want to do more of that. Uh, a lot of times you might have somebody who uh, works a long day and they get to the end of the day and they feel like they haven't accomplished anything and they feel bad about their day. But if they actually scan back through the day, they might be surprised to find out what they actually did accomplish. Um, so that's the first question. Where are you succeeding? Um, what's going well is, a, is a, you know, another way of saying it. Yeah. Uh, the next thing uh, is where are you stuck? What challenges you're facing? And and as a, a, an aside to that, you know, how can I support you? Right. So um, you want to know where somebody where where they're stuck, where the roadblocks are, what they're bumping up against. Sometimes they don't you know, just even voicing that or expressing that starts to unstick the issue for them. Uh, oftentimes we'll also uh, might have a version of that question where we, where we put the onus on 
the employee to come up with a solution. So where are you stuck? What are you doing about it now? And do you need support or help? You know, and so that they start to get into the thinking and problem solving uh, on their own. But those two things, what's going well and where are you stuck, are the are the two foundational questions that I think need to be asked every week. And again, it's it's to put the focus on the positive and then to to help move through the roadblocks. Yeah, I like that. And it's it's almost um, <clears throat> much more in line with kind of the servant leadership model um, where exactly. you're not telling them what to do. You're asking them, how can you help? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So question number three, what are some of your best tips for managing introverts? Um, it's kind of a hot topic lately. Well, maybe not so much lately, but there was a book that came out a few years ago that was kind of caused a stir about introverts. Um, what What's your take on that? Well, you know, I, I, I kind of, I, I'm, I'm one of these, I, I consider myself an ambivert. I've done a lot of these different tests. And so like <laughs> times where I, you know, I, 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 and what's interesting about introversion is, is it, it tends to be related to where you recharge as a person. So, you know, oftentimes I will need some solo time to recharge, but I'll also get a lot of energy being around people. So it goes back and forth, but people who are very far on the introverted scale, um, sometimes will also show up as reserved and quiet, uh, because they spend a lot of time recharging on their own, and they're more comfortable in their own like headspace and in their own their own mindset. And when you when you have a conversation with them, uh, they may not feel so comfortable fully expressing themselves in conversation uh, and on the spot, right? So, um, and, and and also in group situations, you may find that somebody who uh, you know may be very vocal one on one. You put them in a group of four or five people, and they're they, they're not the loudest voice. They're not dominating the conversation, and they might have a lot to share. So giving giving introverts space, you know, making sure you 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 have one on one time with them, that you really uh, you know you you create a high degree of safety and trust in the relationship, right? And and how you do that, the, the fastest way to trust is vulnerability. So you know you you share more. Of yourself, uh, you reveal that maybe you don't have all the answers, but you're here to support, right? And you're on the same journey that they are, and allows them to feel safe and opening up to you, and you create a, a more trusted connection. The second is giving people space to communicate in ways that they feel more comfortable. Uh, we had a we had a um, uh, a customer of ours who's the head of engineering at HubSpot wrote a blog post called "Why Engineers Don't Talk," and uh, you know they tend to be you know there's there's a correlation between you know folks who are engineers and introverts. It's not always that way, but there yeah. you know sometimes you find that, and uh, and so they found that giving people space to express themselves in writing. Uh, was was much better than than you know kind of group conversations and and giving them a place to to provide feedback in, in a means that they feel comfortable with maybe that's through their computer and technology through their phone etc. Huh, that's very interesting because I know actually for me um, I, I end up writing a lot of emails and I know that everyone's like oh get out of email you know it's it's <laughs> killing me but I found that I do a lot of very good thinking while I'm typing up emails and yes. like, I don't even know what I think about a subject till I go to write the, the email about it. Um, a lot of times, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm very similar actually. Yeah. So, but, so, but giving people then space to rather than confront them about something and, and put them on the spot to explain, maybe, uh, give them a little bit of time to prep with a email yes. about it and then they'll have a chance to work through it. Just like you and I need to work through it. Um, putting, you know, finger to the keyboard. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yep. So question four, what are the best questions to, to ask if you're managing a remote team? Because that seems to be the trend that um, we're heading towards where oh, much sure. more flexibility and work schedules and um, you don't have that same maybe in-person dynamic that you, you could have with a traditional office um, where it's maybe harder to build some of the social ties and trust when everyone's remote. Um, what, yes. What, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's great. So, um, in, in you know, yes, we're finding lots of companies who are starting completely distributed and stay that way. Even in a company like our company, we have a, an office in New York and San Francisco and a bunch of people in Europe. And and even the San Francisco office, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, we're, we're more mobile, you know, even though we have an office to come back to. So, so it, it, it is, it's a really important question. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, before we go into the questions, it's important to, to, to understand, like, well, what are what are some of the issues of uh, in the dynamics of a distributed team versus an in-person team? And there's two two primary. One is uh, uh, visibility, right? So there's um, understanding. There's a lot that's communicated 
even without language, when you're in the same space, you kind of have a, a sense for what people are working on. You're, you're bumping into them randomly and having conversations, right? So there's a, there's a lot less structured interaction. Uh, and so there's a visibility issue. And then there's also the connection issue. So people can feel isolated and disconnected, especially if they're fully uh, remote. Like my assistant lives in Western Washington State. And so, you know, my interactions with her are through... Um, uh, through like a zoom video chat and whatnot, mostly. So the questions then stem out of that. So if you, if you focus on those two things, it's like, how do I create more visibility of me, of them and them of me? Uh, and then also connection between team members, then you can get curious about, well, what questions might I ask? Uh, some of them, you know, I think is, is getting a sense for, uh, we do something called goals and accomplishments, which is simply, you know, what are your top three priorities for this week? And then what was accomplished last week uh, relative to what you said last week? So that's a great way to um, to get a sense for is progress being made, made, have somebody actually also take the time to reflect on what they're going to be focused on in the next week and then have some simple accountability on the back end. Uh, but then you don't really need to micromanage so much uh, when you when you give someone the autonomy to say, here's where I'm going. And you may have a chance to intervene and say, oh, that's great. And I think maybe we should be focused on this. Uh, you know, so there's an opportunity to, to have that visibility before an entire week goes by. And then you realize maybe there was the wrong direction taken or something like that. Uh, the other one is is creating connectivity between the team. Uh, outside of just normal work interactions. So we use something called Slack, as many people do, or HipChat or things like that. You know, those are great for the, um, you know, hey, here's what I'm working on here, and can you help me with that? And we're doing work activity or some project management software. But, but actually giving people an opportunity to notice, recognize, and acknowledge other team members uh, is, a, is a great practice. And so one of the questions we ask is, like, who, would you, who do you want to give a high five to? Uh, on, you know, else on the team, Publicly, right? This week. To, Public. So everyone can exactly. see that. So everyone else can see that. So like, Hey, you know, I, I you know, you know, our engineers in, 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 uh, Ukraine is giving a high five to somebody on our customer success team in San Francisco for the work that they did. And who knew that they were even having an interaction together. Right. And they were able to publicly acknowledge each other. And then, and that creates not only a bond between those two, but also, you know, creates a, a visibility for the rest of the company that these things are happening. Uh, and then the other thing, uh, what we do is, um, and we use questions like outside of our product too. We we uh, we um, we do three all hands fifteen minute meetings every week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine a.m. And you know, so we like we said, we've got a group of people in Europe, New York, and San Francisco that get together on video chat. And we do something called Question Friday. Uh, it's an optional. Uh, it's an optional practice, and this is gener- This is designed to cr- you know create the cohesiveness of culture and team, and it's it's non-work questions. Uh, whoever is the who we call the question master on a particular Friday chooses the question master for the next Friday, and they get to ask any sort of question about um, uh, something non-work related. Uh, you know, it could be. You know, what was uh, what was your first job in, in high school? What was the what was the hardest thing you had to deal with as a teenager? It might be somewhat, you know, vulnerable. Uh, and, you know, people can opt in or opt out if they want. You know, it tends not to get too too edgy, I'd say. Who are they uh, asking this of? So they ask it of everyone who's on the call. Okay. So anyone who wants to participate on the call joins, and we get to learn about, you know, each other in, you know, all these different facets of, of who we are, you know, about – Things that we're inspired about, things that we have created in the past, uh, you know, all sorts of things. And it creates this cohesiveness and connection uh, that you wouldn't have because, you you know, we're not all together. We all get together once a year. Um, And so we don't have those few moments like, hey, let's go out to lunch and we're having a a side conversation. So engineering that in uh, so that we create the cohesiveness, um, you know, through questions, you know, lets us slowly reveal more and more about ourselves and be known to each other. What uh, what percentage of your total team would you guess shows up on a typical Question Friday? Uh, about eighty percent. That's pretty uh, good. Yeah. Eighty ninety percent. Yeah. Nice. So it's pretty popular. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, because how else would you get those kind of little random, you know, factoids about each other that are kind of the glue interpersonally? Exactly. Yeah. So question number five: What have you personally used um, in in asking better questions for growing your business and, and helping your company succeed? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the first question I would say that, 
um, even gave rise to 15.5. I remember when I was getting ready to start my next thing and I, you know, I'd run a few companies before and I was clear that if we had any degree of success, this was going to be at least the 10 year journey of my life. Yeah. And you know, there's only so many decades that you have. Right. And, and I wanted it to matter and I wanted it to, I wanted to create something with, with the meaningful impact in the world. And, and, uh, um, so I had, I had, met Simon Sinek and I think in 2007 a lot of people have seen his work and whatnot but this yeah. is prior before he did his famous TED talk in 2009 and it was right around that time actually his TED talk came out um, and I remember just sitting down in, in my in my home in San Francisco and I just wrote the word why with a big question mark on this pad of paper I mean I literally sat down to kind of work on the strategy for what I was going to create but I, I, I stopped myself and I just wrote the question why and and, and I think that question, is so underused and so powerful, right? It's like, why am I doing this? What is the motivation underlying what what I'm going to create? You know, and what is the why that I want to create? So for, you know, we, we've evolved our assignment actually helped us actually craft some of the messaging. Internally, we say our why is to create the space for people to be their greatest selves, right? So our whole, whole business exists to elevate people's greatness in our company with the people we you know, our customers through our product with the, the writing we put out there, et cetera. Um, and, and, and that, and that drives us, right? So I'd say that was one, you know, really foundational question and something we continue to ask. It's, it's like, as we grow the business, it's, uh, are we going to choose to, to raise capital or not? Right. And it's like, well, 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 why, you know, and really dig into the underlying, like the motivations and the, the pros and the cons and things like that. So that's, that's been huge. Um, trying to think of some other questions that have uh, influenced the company um you know we like i said the question friday piece is is really big uh you know we're, we're very big into inquiry as well you know i'd say that we, we in addition to question friday we also do something called gratitude mondays uh so on mondays we uh uh someone gets to share you know some sometimes very very inane things that you might not even think to be grateful for that are just obviously in your life like oh my god that is really incredible like the the oxygen that flows through your blood <laughs> right and how fast your blood circulates through your body every you know every x amount of time and these types of things that you're just like wow that's that's miraculous and that's happening right now and you know we, we don't have our attention on it so we spend a minute someone comes up with a gratitude we reflect on that for a minute and we actually get to ask people you know what did that open up for you you know, uh, what, you know, how, you know, how has that impacted you or, or is there anything that came up that's worth sharing with the team? And then we'll go into our numbers and we figure out our goals for the week. So it's, you know, it's a very tactical meeting after that, but, <laughs> but it, it orients people to the positive, which is, which is, uh, which is a strong thing. So those are a couple, those are a, a couple of things that I think have really, um, uh, influenced the, you know, the culture. foundation of the company yeah. and the culture. So a bonus question that we always ask, and this is for a book recommendation. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm excited to see where you, you take this one. <laughs> yeah, so um, the book I have most given out as a gift, uh, because I think it's a very powerful concept, and it's become actually a lot more, uh, I would say it's a lot more talked about in a different term. The book the book that I've given out is called Unique Ability, and it's put out by Strategic Coach. Now, they do a, you know, a multi-year-long entrepreneur coaching program, but you certainly don't need to do their program to, to really get this book. And the concept of unique ability, you may have heard it called zone of genius. Um, people talk about their zone of genius, is this place where there's this intersection of your talents you might kind of think of like a Venn diagram. You've got your talents in one circle. You've got what you're passionate about in another circle, and they intersect. And some people would even say, you know, something that's valuable to the marketplace, some valuable yeah. skills. So th- those three, uh, it's like the hedgehog concept people have talked about with that. Um, when you find this place, when you are in your zone of genius or your unique ability, uh, you find yourself um, losing track of time. It's a place where people look at you and say, wow, you're, you're really amazing at that. You tend to overlook it as, as even valuable because most of us are focusing on improving all our weaknesses and we don't even value the things we're great at. So we don't even spend time on that. Um, but it's actually the highest leverage thing you can be focusing your attention on. And 
fastest path to fulfillment and creating impact in the world, if we can all know what the, this is for ourselves. So this book really beautifully lays out the concept, but also gives you a roadmap for how to discover it for yourself. And um, and I think it's a, a foundational thing. Inside of our company, we do use the term as a genius. So one of our core values is maximize our zone of genius. And uh, and so we help people you know, identify what that is for them. Yeah, that's great. I think I've heard it said kind of in a different way, like backed into it of you should focus on things that are easy for you that other people think are really difficult. (laughs) That's exactly right. Right. And the trap also is like uh, a lot of times you might have things that you just really don't enjoy doing. You might even be good at them. Um, But the opportunity cost is you're not focusing on those things that are easy, that that are difficult for others. And you might feel bad about delegating those things that you don't like doing because you're like, well, no one else would like doing this. Well, it turns out there are people who love doing that, right? And so you can create this amazing, like, team of of, of, you know, kind of genius areas or, or this unique ability symphony, they might call it, you know, like yeah. where people are in their zone of genius or unique ability doing the thing they should be doing. Yeah. It's basic comparative advantage. Exactly. But in human yep. talent. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, David, it's been a real pleasure having you on and, uh, hearing all your thoughtful, um, ideas on, on different, uh, questions. And I think something that uh, everyone can take away from that is just think about asking better questions. Um, exactly and uh you're probably going to get better answers and and better results yep yep absolutely thanks so much thank you thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed this interview if you'd like to support this author and purchase their book click here if you'd like to become a subscriber to 5gq click here and i included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here thanks happy reading